Today's video, we're going to take a look at an overview of VRFs, also known as virtual routing and forwarding, and how we can configure these on our Cisco devices. We're going to be going through a lab on GNS3 as part of the video, which can be found in the description below if you want to follow along. This video forms part of the CCMP Enterprise Core Exam Series 350 or 401. The exam topic covered in this video is 2.2a, which is to configure and verify data path virtualization technologies, including VRFs. So first things first, let's go over a quick overview of VRFs and the benefits they provide. So what VRFs allow us to do is to create completely separate virtual routers within a physical router. In some ways, similar to how VMs work. What these virtual routers will do is prevent traffic from one of our VRFs, communicating or forwarding traffic to another VRF. This works similarly to how VLANs work at layer 2, however this operates at layer 3 on our OSI model. By default, without the use of VRFs, our routers use a single global routing table, which contains all of our routers interfaces and routes that we've learned are added statically. With the use of VRFs, we can separate these out into separate virtual routers and completely segment them. Finally, there are two ways we can implement VRFs. Most commonly, we use VRFs for MPLS deployments to separate and segment customer traffic at the core of our ISP and allow the overlapping of IP addresses and subnets across multiple customers. As this isn't covered as part of the CCMP Enterprise exam, we're not going to be taking a look at this. Instead, we'll be taking a look at what's known as VRF Lite, when we're not using VRFs with MPLS. Before we go into the configuration of VRFs, let's just take a look at the benefits VRFs provide. First of all, each VRF allows us to maintain a completely separate routing table, which in turn allows us to use overlapping IP ranges. Secondly, the use of VRFs allows segmentation between our interfaces, subnets and routing tables. So to help explain VRFs as we configure them on our Cisco devices, here's an example of the topology we're going to be using. Here you can see two customers. In this example, I've just called them customer A and customer B, both of which are connected to our ISP, and both of these want to use the same subnets, 192.168.10.0 slash 24 and 192.168.20.0 slash 24. Now we've gone over the lab, let's go into the configuration. For this, I've got the lab set up already in GNS3. If you want to follow along with this as we go, the lab can be found in the description below. So here we are in GNS3, and you can see our topology on the screen. You can see that we have our two customers, both of which have two routers connected to our ISP. We're using serial links for customer A, and fast ethernet links for customer B, just to make it a bit easier to differentiate between the two on the ISP router. First of all, I'll bring up our console window and connect to our ISP router. Before we start any configuration, I just wanted to show you that our customer array routers already have IP addresses assigned to their interfaces, but customer B doesn't. The reason for this is that without the use of VRFs, our router will reject the use of overlapping subnets until we configure a VRF. If I show you that now by trying to configure an interface on one of customer B's routers, we can see that we get an error stating that the IP address we're trying to use is in use by serial 2 slash 0. Before we get into the configuration, I'm just going to run a quick show IP route so that you can see the difference before we have any VRFs and after we have our VRFs configured. As we only have two interfaces configured at the moment, we're only able to see those at the moment. So first things first, let's go into the configuration mode. The command from here to create the VRF is IP VRF, and then the name we want to call it. In this case, I'll call it customer A. You can see that once we've entered the command, we can go into a sub configuration mode for that VRF, which I'll show you here. However, this is outside the topics of the video. If I exit out of here and create our VRF for customer B, as I've already done for customer A. Now that's done, we have our two VRFs created, or virtual routers, for both customers. We can confirm this by running the show IP VRF command, which will show both of our VRFs and that we currently have no interfaces associated with them. So the next step is to add our interfaces to our VRFs. I'll start off with customer A. This is done via the interface command. So let's go into the interface serial 2 slash 0. The command we then need to use is IP VRF forwarding and then the name of the VRF we want to use. In this case, customer A. You'll notice that when I enter the command, it removes our IP address from our interface. This will happen if we have an IP address assigned to an interface we are adding a VRF to. 
The interface has been added to the VRF, however no longer has an IP address as you can see here. All we need to do is reconfigure the interface with an IP address again. And you can see we now have our interface in the customer A VRF with our required IP address. We can confirm the interface is in the customer A VRF by exiting out of configuration mode again and running a show IP VRF command. You can see in here now that customer A VRF is listing serial 2 slash 0 as being part of the VRF. From here all we need to do is repeat the configuration on the rest of our interfaces, adding the interfaces to the correct VRF on the router. Now that's been completed, that's all of our configuration complete. We only need to apply the VRF configuration on our ISP router. We'll then exit out of configuration mode once completed and run a show IP VRF again. You can see now that all of our interfaces are showing under the relevant VRF we have configured. In addition to this, let's run a show IP interface brief. From here we can see that we now have overlapping 192.168.10.0 and 192.168.20.0 subnets configured on both of our customer networks. If I run a show IP route again, you can see now that our routing table is empty. As explained before, this is the global routing table, and as we have no interfaces in the global VRF, which is used for the interfaces not configured to use a VRF, we have no interfaces that are using this routing table anymore, as all the interfaces we're using have been configured to either one of our customer A or customer B VRFs. In order to show the routing table of our VRFs, we need to run the show IP root VRF command, followed by the name of the VRF. You can see here that our customer A routing table shows us just the routes for our customer A routers. In addition to this, if we do the same for customer B, this just shows us the routes for our customer B routers. We can verify that we have segmentation between the two customers and confirm that routing is working as required. We can do this by using the ping VRF command followed by the VRF name, here I'll use customer A, and then the IP address we want to ping. Just to show you that the pings are hitting the correct device and traffic is segmented, I'm going to run a debug IP ICMP on both of our customers' R2 devices. From here on our ISP router, I'll then ping customer A's R2 device. We can see that traffic hits customer A, but not customer B's router. And there we have it. That's a complete overview of what VRFs are and the benefits they provide within our network. If you have any questions, please let me know in the comments. Apart from that, remember to subscribe and like the video for more CCMP Enterprise videos. I hope you've enjoyed and I'll catch you next time.